Namaste and welcome to Live, Love, Engage. I am Gloria Grace Rand and we're going to be talking today with my very special guest about really about uh, overcoming COVID <laughs> actually and, yes, and yes. About a, a whole bunch of things but uh, but really how how are we how are we surviving in this uh, in this age and i want to welcome uh jeff steinberg to live love engage uh so welcome jeff finally we get a chance to do this <laughs> i know yes yes we've had a couple false starts <laughs> before we finally connected but but we did and and it's funny i we actually both live in the same uh general vicinity you know we're both in the orlando area and and i've just met met you earlier this year through through a networking event i think that's hosted by somebody who even lives in california maybe I, i'm not sure but um <laughs> but it was wonderful to be able to connect and let me tell you uh, especially for those of you listening um let me tell you a little bit about this extraordinary gentleman he is a keynote speaker humorist singer and author with a very special message the, the least likely person can accomplish the most extraordinary things in a most unusual way. You are a masterpiece in progress. And he was born with what most folks would actually call handicaps. So he has no arms and badly compromised legs. And despite that, Jeff Steinberg refused to quit. And he is living proof that the difficult we do right away, the impossible takes a little longer. I like that quote. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's my father that's told me that. Oh, your father told you that? Wow. Well, words of wisdom. I like that. Um, so let's let's jump in because you know he you have overcome certainly a lot and certainly more than many of us um, deal with on a daily basis. So share a little bit, if you would, uh, about your story and um, you know how you you know what took something that would maybe send other people into a tailspin and just, you know, permanent depression, you have been able to do remarkable things in your life. Well, uh, Gloria, I, I'm a thalidomide baby. Mm. I don't know if many of your people in the audience know what thalidomide is, but it was a drug that was introduced into the United States in 1948, came in via England and then went up into Canada stayed mostly in the northeast of the United States from 1948 until 1953. Now, the purpose of thalidomide was to help women, pregnant women who were having trouble keeping their pregnancy, spotting, nausea, uh, anything that would, you know, might cause a miscarriage or might, you know, make them sick or, you know, sex like that. Because what thalidomide did was it boosted the mother's immune system. Oh, okay. And it did that mm -hmm. and much more. Mm -hmm. What they didn't know in 1951 was that thalidomide also causes multiple birth defects, mm -hmm. uh, limb deficiencies, missing limbs, uh, limb deformities, mm -hmm. some uh, thalidomide babies, they have uh, no arms and their legs have missing bones. And so their legs basically flop around oh because goodness. they have nothing to stand on, even right. though the leg is there. Yeah. Um, things like that. In my case, I was born with no arms. Mm -hmm. I have a little, uh, about a two to three inch stump on my right side mm -hmm. that I wear an artificial arm on and then nothing on my left shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, I have... Um, both of my legs were scissored crisscross. Remember in the old westerns when you'd see the Indians sit in a powwow with their legs crisscrossed over yeah. top of each other? Well, that's kind of the way I was. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was born, my mother didn't know about me uh, right away. In fact, my grandmother was the first person to see me. Mm -hmm. And she called my dad, who was then a letter carrier for the uh, US Postal Service in the uh, Philadelphia area. And when she finally got a hold of him, all she could say to him was, come quick. It's the baby. He's not right. Hmm. Um, my father came and immediately instructed 
the doctors that under no circumstances were there they to tell her anything until they knew for sure or until he gave word because the doctors didn't think I was going to live. Mm, yeah. So if I was going to die, then there was no point in my mother hitching her horse to that wagon, so to speak. Yeah. And I think he did her a disservice. Yeah. I really do. Mm -hmm. Because you don't, you don't overcome, you don't rise above anything or overcome any circumstance unless you first are willing to face that circumstance. Exactly, yeah. And deal with it. Mm -hmm. And so um, my mother did not know about my disability until I was almost 17 months old. Oh my goodness. Uh, you can keep it a secret in the hospital for a long time. We're waiting for tests. We're waiting for results of tests. There have been complications oh. and days turn into weeks and weeks turn into months. And before long, my mother started to wonder if whatever it is that they weren't telling her was so bad that maybe it would be better if it went away, mm. if it died. Mm. My grandmother came into the kitchen one night against my father's wishes, one day rather, against my father's wishes who had told her specifically, do not tell your daughter. Hmm. And she sat down at the kitchen table. Mom was over at the counter across the room dicing something for dinner. And my grandmother said in her broken Lithuanian accent, Ruti, he's alive. My mom set the knife down on the counter. She leaned against it and didn't even turn around. She said, mom, why won't they let me see him? Mm -hmm. Is he ugly? Mm -hmm. And I think she thought that maybe I was facially deformed, yeah, yeah. retarded, facially deformed, right. you know, whatever. And my grandmother stood up, walked over to her put her arm around her and said, no, Ruti, he's not ugly. <laughs> he's beautiful. Mm. He has a Yiddish cup, a Yiddish face, <laughs> a Jewish face. Yeah. I was almost two years old. First of all, I would not have wanted to have been at dinner that night mm. when dad came home and found yeah. out <laughs> that mom knew. Yeah, <laughs> that was not going to be a, a, a fun time for anybody. No, definitely not. I was almost two years old when my mom and my oldest sister, Linda, and my grandmother and my dad and the new baby, which was Harriet, or Cheryl rather, because she was 17 months younger than I, mm. came to see me. And my mom picked me up and she held me and she paced the floor with me in her arms back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then turned and placed me back where she found me, swung around, stood as tall as her four foot eight frame would hold her, mm -hmm. looked at my father and said, Irving, take me home. I'm ready to leave now. It would be many years later and many tears later before my mom and I would come face to face on the subject. Mm -hmm. She would look me in the eye and she would tell me, Jeffrey, I did not nurse you. I did not raise you. I didn't even know how to love you. Wow. That'll make your day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To make a long story short, because it's like 68 years, <laughs> <laughs> I, from the time I was two and a half years old until I was eight years old, I was in and out of Shriners Hospital for crippled children in Philadelphia. Hmm. There are 19 Shriners Hospitals for kids like me and three for children with severe burns, yet not one parent of any child that walks through their doors ever pays, mm. not even a penny. Yeah. They operated on my legs to straighten them. 
They straightened my right leg, discovered there was no joint in the knee. They fused it back together stiffly, they cleaned away valuable growth tissue. And I was, and I'll always be four feet, six inches tall. Michael Jordan, eat your heart out. <laughs> I learned to do all kinds of things with my feet. I learned to write with my feet. I used to suck my big toe. Can you do that, Gloria? No, I can't. I can't reach. <laughs> I used to feed Maybe when I was younger. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, probably. I used to feed myself with my feet. Mm. Can you do that? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Can you get your feet to your mouth? I don't. I'm not going to try. <laughs> right now. I don't know. I, 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 I can see, you, but uh, yeah, that's about as far as I can go. <laughs> I was told you were pretty good at putting your feet in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> When I was, uh, I had about 25 to 35 plus operations. They fitted me with my very first artificial arm, which back then was nothing more than a stump socket with a spoon attached yeah. that was made to stay level so that I could learn to feed myself. Mm. I, um, I went to school from Shriners. When I was eight years old, I got to go home. I think that's the one thing I wanted more than anything in the world. Oh, yeah. I wanted to be a brother. I wanted to be a son. I wanted to be a grandson. And I wanted to be a kid in the neighborhood who got Absolutely. a chance to play with other kids. Yeah. But it got to be too difficult for my mom and dad to take care of me and three girls. Yeah. It was the girls that were the problem. <laughs> it's always the girls. That are the yeah, I know. I've got a daughter, so I can relate. <laughs> well, think about it. Mom, what do I wear? They got a whole <laughs> closet full of clothes they haven't touched. <laughs> I got nothing to wear. <laughs> wear the blue dress there. But I wore that last year. <laughs> we really, you know. Anyway, uh, but I digress. Uh, after nine months, I was moved to a foster home where I lived for about... Uh, eight weeks mm. and then and they had a daughter that had uh, cerebral palsy and then i was moved again my father and mother picked me up and they drove me 63 miles away to a home for kids with disabilities and old people called good shepherd mm. in Allentown, pennsylvania and from there i went to public school mm. i graduated from public high school I learned to drive a car. Nice. Um, and I went from there to go to college in the area. Hmm. Um, I participated in all kinds of talent shows. Uh, I was the class clown. <laughs> my first day in high school, in my in my math class and geometry class, I got to leave early and arrive late if necessary. Mm -hmm. But as I was getting ready to leave, and of course the teacher was telling the class, and as I was walking out, I said to the teacher in front of the whole class, goodbye, Mr. Don Moyer, don't think this hasn't been fun, because it hasn't. <laughs> and that set the pace for a relationship with him that I spanned many, many years because he laughed and he saw the humor in it and mm -hmm. realized that we were gonna be really good friends. And, he, and he, he was an amazing man. Years later, when I would go back to my high school to speak to the kids, he would invite me to come into his class. And he always had an empty seat right at the door. And every class, unless his class was full to overflowing, right. that seat always remained empty. And he always told his class on the first day, that seat belongs to Jeff Steinberg. And he would tell the story of me and our and, and yeah. my story. And then I would come in and talk to the kids. Mm. I started a singing group in college. We were uh, we were a trio. There were five of us in the group. Obviously, math is not our strong suit. I was going to say, uh, yeah. <laughs> that sounds more like a quintet. <laughs> well, we actually were a trio because there were only three of us singing. Ah, okay. The rest were band members. Okay. 
Gotcha. And they don't care. <laughs> Just that any band. The band yeah. members don't care. I'm, I'm a musician. I take exception. But uh, I play uh, as well as sing. So, you know. <laughs> and it reminds me of the old line from the Oak Ridge Boys song from years ago that says, nobody wants to play rhythm guitar behind Jesus. Yeah. Everybody wants to be the lead singer in the band. That's right, yeah. <laughs> so what can I say? Back to my story. I appeared, I, I met a man in October of 1972. He was a well-known gospel singer by the name of Doug Oldham. He was about 6'6". Six, six, oh my. And he weighed about 429 pounds. Ooh, that's a big and he guy. was an incredible singer. Mm. And he was appearing regularly on a TV show called The Old Time Gospel Hour mm. with Dr. Jerry Falwell at Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia. Mm. And on October 29th, 1972, I appeared on The Old Time Gospel Hour. And Doug and I sang a duet. We sang Through It All by the uh, incomparable Andre Crouch. Mm. And we did it as a duet, and that launched a career. Around 1990, around 1979, I went solo, and in 1985, I met Zig Ziglar at a multi-level marketing convention mm. in Charlotte, North Carolina. And he said, Jeff, you have a message that goes beyond the walls of the church right. because you have something that can inspire people. Mm -hmm. By that time, I was starting to figure out that being fearfully and wonderfully made, which is what I was told when I was 11 years old, mm -hmm. is more than just something to quote from the book of Psalms. That it was an attitude and it was a, a commitment. Mm -hmm. That I could be a glove for God to wear to touch others. I could be a masterpiece for others to see. And so can you. Hence, I started down a different road, right. still singing and speaking in churches, but also adding some new roads to that, to that journey. And I started singing and speaking for conventions, awards dinners, banquets, fundraisers, school assemblies. Those are fun. Yeah. Because you get to be on the side of the student mm -hmm. and at odds with the principal. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you get to have all kinds of stories. And uh, um, I would sing and speak in prisons and fundraisers, and mm -hmm. all kinds of things like that. So that's my story. I told my mom one day that I was getting married. My mom said, don't do that. It wouldn't be fair to whoever marries you to have to take care of you and themselves. And then I told them that my wife was expecting our first child. And she said, don't do that either. She said, because then she'd have to take care of you and a baby. Mm -hmm. And uh, that little baby boy was born very normal, mm -hmm. with whatever normal is. Yeah. I, I believe that the word normal is a euphemism for ordinary. Mm, I agree. And I don't know about you, and I don't know about your audience, but I I don't want to be ordinary. Mm -hmm. I want to be extraordinary. Absolutely. And so that little boy grew up. He's 43 years old now. He is a nurse practitioner. He has two children of his own. Uh, a boy and a girl, mm -hmm. the boy is 13. I told him when, when his son was born, I said, my fondest wish for you is that all of your children should become as you were. Mm. Kind of like the ultimate parental curse. Yes, I know, yes. My, my mother used to say that. <laughs> and it all washed back on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's a good kid. Yeah. And, and, and I have just celebrated October 29th, my 48th year of being on the road as a speaker, as a singer, as a motivational, whatever, force. <laughs> well, congratulations. That is quite an accomplishment. 
and uh, yeah, one to be really proud of. And and you are extraordinary, and I appreciate you sharing the story. Um, you know, I know we wanted to talk about COVID, but I would like to just ask you, really, what was it just something always in you that you felt that you just weren't going to let, you know, the situation stop you? Because I mean, certainly, you know, you, you know, your mom, God love her, she didn't really support you. It sounded like, you know, especially early on. And yet there was something in you that seems to be that just, you know, wouldn't quit. So remember, remember the old Broadway song? I think it was in Porgy and Bess. I don't remember. But yeah, you know, anything you can do, I can do better. Yes. I can do anything better than you. <laughs> well, <You can't. laughs> I, I was one of those kids hmm. who, if I saw a challenge and somebody said, you can't do that, you don't have any arms, I just look at it and say, bet me. <laughs> Watch me. Hmm. Because the truth is, I did things from taking watches apart and putting them back together again. And sometimes they actually worked. Wow. <laughs> you know, if, 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 if something broke down, I would try to figure it out, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I was always the guy, you know, I could use my feet for some things. I could use my mouth for some things. I write with a pen in my mouth. I use a stylus. I even drive a car. Somebody asked me once, they said, how do you drive? I said, fast. <laughs> But I, I, I can't use my right foot to drive, okay. you know, for the, for yeah. the gas, for the acceleration and the braking. So I use my left foot okay. and I have a, an extended left foot gas pedal, which because I'm short, by the way, I was in a concert one time and I said to the audience, I said, it's heck being short. And there's one lady, it was in the South, you yeah. know, where they don't just tease their hair, they make it mad. <laughs> you, know, she, you know, I mean, she, she had enough hairspray on her that if you laid a match, she would explode. She uh, raised her hand and she said, young man, young man. And I looked at her and I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you're not short. You're vertically challenged. <laughs> and I looked at the audience back and forth and I said, ma'am. I said, you're mentally challenged. I'm short. <laughs> We live in a society that doesn't want to admit the truth. I mean, we don't like who we are. We don't like what we have to offer. So back to uh, <coughs> driving a car. I use a pen. I use a stick in my mouth. Mm. And, um, um, you know, I use a left foot gas pedal that, and a brake extension pedal because I'm short. Mm. And then I have a, they used to call them suicide knots. Hmm. Truckers used them all the time because hmm. that way you could turn the wheel without taking your hand off and oh, you know okay. faster. Gotcha. It became dangerous because people would turn too quickly and then they tip the vehicle over. Hmm. But this has a hole in it like a donut, and I'd okay. I hook in there and I'd be able to go okay. around and around with it. Cool. Because it, it it's they call it a spinner or you know that sort of thing. Yeah. I. Um, my story of learning to drive was pretty funny. I mean, you know, uh, you know, you're in trouble when the police officer who's going to take you for your driver's test counts the wheels to make sure there are four <laughs> before he gets in the car. Okay. Yeah, stuff like that. But <laughs> you know, it, it's um, I've done all the things that people told me I couldn't do, shouldn't do, or wouldn't do. But that's the nature of who I was. Mm -hmm. I didn't ever, and part of it was because I didn't want to be left out of anything. Ah, okay. All right. you know, that makes sense. Yeah, um, absolutely. Look, some people walk with sandals. Mm -hmm. Some people walk on high heels. Some people walk in um, leather shoes. Mm -hmm. Some people walk with wheels. Some people you walk with crutches. I'm not defined by the things I wear. Right. 
And if you allow your life to be defined by the things you need in order for you to be functioning, then you've missed the point. One of the, the things that I talk to audiences about is if you're not getting to where you need to be in life, maybe it's because you're getting all, and you're getting all the wrong answers in your opinion. Maybe it's because you're asking all the wrong questions. Mm-hmm. You so, see, yeah. who am I? Mm-hmm. Well, everybody's got a story to tell, but most of us don't like who we are. I love who I am. I look in the mirror and I see a masterpiece. Mm. I see possibilities. I see, okay, what kind of accomplishment can we make today that everybody else would say, no way, he can't do that. That's just not possible. Second question, what are my talents and my gifts? Mm -hmm. And what are my limitations and disabilities? Mm -hmm. Now, you have to acknowledge the one in order to grant the other. Mm -hmm. You see, we all have abilities and everybody loves to talk about our abilities, but we also all have limitations and disabilities. Mm -hmm. Uh, Somebody said today on the news, they said, there isn't anything a person can't do. Well, I beg to differ. Just go to the top floor of any downtown Orlando building, open the window, step out on the ledge, jump off, flap your arms as fast as you can, and you will find a limitation you can neither meet nor beat. That's true. Absolutely. You see, we all have limitations. So let me be very clear. My limitations are the things I cannot do. Mm -hmm. I will never be able to give myself a bath. I will never be able to throw a basketball into a hoop, even though I get called hook shot all the time. <laughs> I, uh, there are things I cannot do. Right. But that allows me to focus on the things I can. I do graphics design. Mm-hmm. I do video editing. I am a singer. Mm-hmm. I'm told that Neil Diamond sounds like me. I met him once. I told him, I said, people tell me I sound like you. Has anybody ever told you you sound like me? (laughs) What did he say? (laughs) And his eyes got really big and he looked down at me and he said, no, not that I can recall. And I'm thinking, get a life, Neil. (laughs) Rent one. I am a, a, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a grandfather. I'm incredibly talented, very, very cute and mostly humble. Absolutely. And if you don't believe me, just ask me and I'll tell you again. (laughs) Here's the point. We all have things we can do. Mm -hmm. Okay. We also all have things we can't. Right. Don't worry about what you can. Quit focusing on the handicap Mm -hmm. and start appreciating the gift. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because you can learn how to overcome some things and maybe you can learn to do some of the things you can't do and then whatever you can't if it's just impossible like you said you know jumped off a building you're not gonna be able to fly by flapping your arms however that doesn't mean that you couldn't come up with some other way of being able to do it well move on yeah i i met a young man (laughs) oh by the way i drive uber too (laughs) yes your uber driver has no arms I had a guy got in my car, looked at my hook on the wheel. He says, were you born like that? I looked back and forth and I said, no. I said, without the hook? (laughs) That's right. That would really hurt. My mom would not be happy. (laughs) This is going to tear a little. Yeah. (laughs) Here's the point. I had a young man that I met, he was 19 years old. I picked him up late at night around 11 o'clock to take him home from work. Mm -hmm. I knew the minute he got in the car that there was something special about this young man. We got to talking a little bit and and, uh, uh, he said, 
my boss usually takes me home from work, but she couldn't do that. And so, you know, we chatted a little bit and in the silence, he said, I think I can tell you because of who you are and what you look like. And because I think you'd understand. He said, I have autism. Hmm. And we got to talking and I said, well, what do you want to do with your life? And he said, I want to be a pilot. Hmm. And he said, when I retire or when I'm through piloting, I want to open a retreat center for burned out pilots. <laughs> airline pilots, military mm -hmm. pilots, people who need a place to just kind of decompress. Yeah. Well, when he told me he wanted to be a pilot, I said, do you think the FAA will allow you to be a pilot because of your autism? And he said, I think every case ought to be judged on its own merit. This is a 19 year old kid with autism. Very high functioning. Yeah, but still, he inspired me mm. because he had a vision of what he could, what he could do with yes. his life, and that's special. Um, okay. You know, he knew why he was there, mm. uh, and that's the third question you need to ask yourself: Why am I here? Mm. I'm here to make you laugh. I'm here to inspire you. I'm here to tell you that no matter how bad things look in your life, yeah. you can look in the mirror and see a masterpiece. And you don't have to see a convict. You don't have to see a CEO. You don't have to see uh, somebody facing a struggle, mm -hmm. family man with hurts and, or even disabilities. Right. Why, you know, Mark Twain said, the two most important days in a man's life is first the day he's born. Mm -hmm. And then the day he finds out why he yes. was born. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that quote. You see, that's the thing. I know why I'm here. Mm -hmm. That young man at 19 knows why he's here. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of all of the frustrations that's going on today, COVID and all of that, right. we need to look in the mirror or in our Zoom window <laughs> or our FaceTime before yeah. we log on and see ourselves and see a masterpiece mm -hmm. and see opportunities. Look, I, I've had to reinvent myself. It's more difficult to, to, to get to stages and stand in front of audiences because the whole entertainment slash motivational speakers mm -hmm. industry has been set on its ear. Yeah, absolutely. So what do I do? I get invited by people like you, wonderful people who say, I have an audience of people that need to be inspired. Mm -hmm. Now, how am I gonna make money from that? I don't know. Send me an email. Book me to speak online for your group. There you go. And I'll tell you what I tell everybody. I'm not cheap, but I'm easy. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. But uh, we're living in a time that's scary. Mm -hmm. People are afraid. Yeah, absolutely. And they don't know whether to go out or not to go out, whether to breathe or not to breathe. You know, uh, I, I think we need to remember, and I hate to sound like a preacher, but I, I'm a preacher at heart. God makes no mistakes. Absolutely. Yep. And each of us is fearfully and wonderfully made. Mm -hmm. And we may have to take a detour or two or three. Mm -hmm. And if you can't walk the distance, get a power chair. That's right. Get a scooter. Do something. Hire an Uber driver. <laughs> yeah. Or get an get an Uber driver. Yeah. You know. Or better than Uber, just call me. 
Exactly. <laughs> the fourth thing I tell people to ask, what are my limits hmm. and my boundaries? Now, let, let me be very, very clear. I think your president once said that, right? Let me <laughs> yeah. be very clear. Uh, I stated earlier that my limitations are the things I cannot do. Right. My limits are the things I will not do. Yeah. Good to see. I will not sacrifice my integrity for a dollar. Mm. I will not give up my morality for anything, mm -hmm. for any kind of promotion. It's not worth it when you look in the mirror and, and you know, and, and, and I hear it said all the time, well, nobody will know. Mm. You'll know. Yeah, absolutely. God will know. Mm -hmm. And that little voice in your head, that conscience that says you did wrong, mm -hmm. he knows. Yeah. The day that I left Good Shepherd was the hardest day of my life. Mm. I had told everybody from the day I walked into that place, I was 11 years old, it was Halloween day, 1961, or 1960. I'm not staying in this place. I'm going to leave, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. My graduation was front page news. Yeah. A local junkyard donated a car for me that they had refixed. Oh, nice. Me. Okay. Yeah. And they even outfitted it with, uh, so it was in all the papers that mm -hmm. I was graduating. And it was in all the papers that I, that Louis Cassiola had given me this car. Mm -hmm. And it showed a picture of me behind the wheel. Um, but the hardest day was that day that I finally left Good Shepherd. Now I could have stayed there. Mm -hmm. Gloria, I was placed there as a ward of the state of Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. And I could stay there and because Good Shepherd under its policy could not ask me to leave. Ah, okay. I could have spent the rest of my life there mm -hmm. even without regards to financial ability to pay. That's part of their mission. creed. Yeah. That's okay. part of their mission. Mm -hmm. But under the state, under the word, uh, under the terms of the uh, placement, I could leave either when I turned 18 mm -hmm. or when I turned or graduated from high school, whichever happened first okay. or last, rather, whichever happened last, mm -hmm. or I could choose to stay. Mm -hmm. I got accepted to go to Good Shepherd, to go to United Wesleyan College in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I called my mom and dad, told them I was leaving Good Shepherd because I was going to move in with this couple that had, they were the ones who taught me that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Mm -hmm. They were the Christian couple that kind of had become surrogate mom and dad to me because my relationship with my mom and dad went from the very beginning, it was once a week to slowly once every couple of months, mm. to slowly two, maybe three times a year. Oh, wow. Even though they live 63 miles away. Mm. So I called my mom and dad on Wednesday, told them I was going to leave Good Shepherd. I was going to move in with the Snyders. And they came down from Philadelphia that evening. Oh, I thought, wow. Yeah, if I didn't think it was this easy, I'd have done that. <laughs> And they said, Jeffrey, if you do this, you're on your own. Mm. If you do this, we cannot, will not take care of you mm. if something goes wrong. Right. They said, Jeffrey, if you change your mind, call us before Saturday, by Saturday, mm -hmm. and we'll come to graduation, which was Sunday. Right. Otherwise, we will not be there. Mm. And I wrestled with this from Wednesday night Thursday night, Friday night. And I remember Saturday night laying in my bed, looking up at the ceiling. I didn't see heaven, Gloria. 
Mm. I didn't hear any voice in my head. There was no glow in the room. Yeah. I just said, God, if you're listening, you've always been there for me. My mom and dad haven't. Yeah. I think I'm going to stick with you. That's when I heard in my head, not out loud, mm -hmm. this voice that said, you stick with me, Jeff, and we will go places. We will do things. Mm -hmm. And we will inspire people. So I got to graduation. It was at the great Muhlenberg Hall at Muhlenberg College. And as I'm getting ready to enter the auditorium from one end of the hall, I see a door opening from the other end of the hall. And I see this little girl starting to walk in my direction. For some reason, I just kind of looked at her. She looked familiar. But against the, the light from yeah. the other end, she was more like a silhouette. Mm. And as she got closer, she started to walk faster. And then she started to run. And about halfway, I recognized her as my sister. And she ran and threw her arms around me. She said, Mom and Dad are in the bleachers. I just had to come and tell you that we were here. Oh. And I heard that voice again. Mm. You stick with me, Jeff. We will go places. We will do things. And we will inspire you. Mm. The day that I left Good Shepherd, I stopped at the threshold. And a voice in one side of my head said, you know, you don't have to do this. Now, my stuff was already in the car. Yeah, yeah. You can stay here and you can be secure. Yes. Never have to worry about a dollar mm -hmm. or buying a shirt right. or where to find a meal. Mm -hmm. And then another voice said, you stick with me, Jeff. We will go places, we will accomplish things, and we will inspire people. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, God, what do I do? And I stepped over the threshold, and that's when I, I knew. Mm -hmm. And I never looked back. And my life has been, you know, about going beyond the limits. Mm -hmm. Now, my boundaries are the things that keep me from doing the things that I should not have done. The things that I should have, that I have to do over again to make it right. Mm -hmm. The final thing I tell people, the final question, what kind of a mark will you leave behind for having been here? Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about your name up in lights or you know, when they put a thing in your casket and they look at you and say, doesn't he look like himself? Which, by the way, I'm having a sign made from my, the corner of my casket so that people <laughs> don't have to ask. Okay. <laughs> I told somebody, I said, when, when, at my funeral, I want it to be a comedy show. Mm. I want people to laugh at the things I do. Yeah. I want people to remember the the fun things, but I also want them to remember the encouraging things, mm -hmm. the challenging things. Yeah, absolutely. Every single day, Gloria, we leave a mark on somebody's life. Mm -hmm. They may not tell you right away. I remember a 13-year-old boy dragged his mom to a concert because he heard me at his Catholic school. Hmm. And he ran into the house later that day and he told his mom all about this guy with no arms who made them laugh and who told them that they were fearfully and wonderfully made and that every life matters, every life is important, even a baby, mm -hmm. even a preborn. Okay. Now, his mom didn't really want to hear that, and she certainly didn't want to come hear me because what he didn't know was that morning when he left for school, she and her husband had a major fight. Mm. 
-hmm. he walked out on her. And she had gone, when his school bus was pulling up, she was at the hall cabinet holding a revolver considering suicide. Oh no, oh my goodness. He wouldn't, that boy would not let up. We've got to go here, you got to come here, you got to come. She not only dragged him to the church we were singing at, which was a Catholic church, she dragged him to the third row, second row center. Mm. She said, and she wrote me a couple of weeks later, and she said, Jeff, you don't know this, but you walked out and you looked straight into my eyes and straight into my heart. And I left there thinking, if he can do what he does with what he's got, I can do more. I can maybe make it one more step. I can keep going. I don't know what happened to that mom. I don't know her name. Hmm. I just know that every single day we leave a mark on somebody's life. Hmm. Okay. And the question is, what kind of a mark will we leave? Everybody likes to use the word legacy. I was at a funeral the other day for a lady who truly had an amazing spiritual legacy. Mm. She even wrote her own um, eulogy. Oh, did she? Oh, wow. She said, I don't want anybody to think I'm more than what I really am. Mm. A sinner saved by the grace of God. Mm. She said, what I want you to think about is, what are you going to do with your from here on? She was gracious, she was kind, she was amazing. And at the end of that funeral, I sat there thinking, there's a legacy. Mm -hmm. There's a mark that this woman left behind on somebody, mm -hmm. other people's lives. And I thought that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be said, you know, I, I told my wife, I said, if I, have a, if I have a tombstone, I want it to be put on the tombstone, Jeff Steinberg masterpiece complete thing because that's what we should aim to be is a masterpiece in progress put aside your excuses quit complaining the least likely person can accomplish the most extraordinary things in a most unusual way i saw on the news last night a young man from Indonesia, or from Afghanistan, rather, hmm. walked three days to Turkey to come to the United States. Oh, by the way, did I mention he has no arms? Oh, wow. And he is an Olympic swimmer ah. for the Paralympics. Oh, OK. And he's hoping to represent the United States at the Paralympics. Mm. And he's already come in second. Wow. This is a kid who doesn't know how to take no for an answer because he knows what he's good at. Right. See, that's the difference. These guys that say you can do anything you want, that's not true. I'll never be president. I don't want to be president. <laughs> But my mother used to tell me when I was a kid, Jeffrey, anybody can be president of the United States, even you. Well, there are things I cannot do. But what I know is that God gave me the sense to know and to shoot for what I can. Right. Yeah. And to be good at what I can. And I told my son years ago, you can be anything that you are willing to work hard enough at to be good at. Yes. I to like be that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a better, mm -hmm. that's a better distinction. Yeah. And it's and all the talking, which maybe you got some more questions. <laughs> I don't know. I think you've covered just about everything. Um, Cause you even talked a bit about and what we're, what I talked about at the beginning of is how, um, you know, because a lot of people are scared about COVID and, and 
how to be able to cope with that. And, and I guess, well, one thing I did want to ask you was, um, you know, because you, you did mention that you've had to pivot a little bit with, with COVID and, and you've shared a lot of great messages with us, but you do have disappointments that still come into your life. You know, just like anybody else, you're human, just like, uh, you know, we all are. So how, how do you, um, how do you handle something like that, that, that comes up? What is, do you have a, uh, uh, you know, particular way of uh, approaching something and, and to be able to deal with it? A few months ago, I got helpful for people who are dealing with, you know, COVID right now. Even. Right. A few months ago, I, I got an email from ostensibly from somebody in Japan. Mm. This man supposedly was a billionaire. By the way, he really does exist. Mm. And it was from a foundation that wanted me to come and be a part of a weekend. Mm. I have no idea how they heard of me. I had no idea, uh, I hadn't had a chance to talk to them. Mm -hmm but they were going to pay me an enormous amount of money and they were going to send a private plane and they were going to put us up in a 10 star hotel. I mean, <laughs> it was like, everything was over the top. And a couple of my friends all kept saying to me, Jeffrey, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Right. Yeah. But they had all the, all the look and legitimacy of it. They had the website, they had the uh, proposal with letterhead mm -hmm. and then a contract with letterhead, everything verified, but they wanted me to do something I wasn't real sure I could do. So I wanted to make sure that I could talk to them about it. Right. The end story turned out that, and I I'd called my mom. <laughs> oh, this is great, Jeff, you know, and I mean, I was, it looked like I was really going to get, you know, my feet planted on some solid ground with some very influential people that would help me to move forward. Mm -hmm. By the way, I've never even told David Fagan about this. No. <laughs> um, turns out it was pretty much a scam. Mm. But we were proceeding carefully. Okay. The date isn't until April 2021. Okay. We were doing all the right things. I have a niece that is in the UK. She works for a law firm. She had uh, one of their attorneys that lives in Japan try to vet the information right. and found out it wasn't for real. Mm -hmm. And my mom was talking to my wife on the phone and I had her mention to her that it looks like it fell through. And my mom said to my wife, well, that's pretty much the way it is with Jeffrey. He always gets these really big ideas and then they don't work out. No. <laughs> I was really wounded. I was really hurt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my mom was 97 years old. Now she's 98. This was before her birthday. And to think that with all the work that I had done to try to rebuild this relationship, mm -hmm. that we were still steps away from being anywhere near what we wanted. I mean, I knew we weren't going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. It felt like we were going backwards and I was really hurt. Mm -hmm. And I had to remember something that my wife used to tell me all the time. You can only expect from people as much as they're able to give. And then you've got to either decide to make you, whether it's going to make you bitter mm -hmm. or better. Right. And I have chosen to move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. My ex-wife told me once or told an interviewer once that, you know, Jeffrey's always looking for the next big thing. But that's what you have to do. Yeah, absolutely. 
when one door closes, you walk to the next one. That's right. When one window closes, you try to open the shades. Mm -hmm. Somewhere you cannot quit. Yeah. Now, there's a difference between knowing when to walk away mm -hmm. and when to quit. It's okay to fail. Mm -hmm. As long as you keep falling forward, as long as you keep failing forward. Uh, Rocky Balboa said, and this is my last thought on this, if, unless you want to know more. Rocky Balboa said in the last Rocky movie, he said, life is not all sunshine and rainbows. It will knock you down and it will keep knocking you down. And the secret of success or failure is not in whether you get knocked down, but whether you keep getting up mm -hmm. and keep moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. You can not stop moving forward. The greatest disappointment of my life was the day that our 14 month old grandson was killed by a drinking driver. Oh, so sorry. Who hit, hit our daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, and our grandson was 14 months old. Mm -hmm. Life is going to hit you with disappointments. It's going to keep on knocking you down. Mm -hmm. The question is, what are you going to do it? The true champion is the guy who keeps getting up yeah. and keeps moving forward and sees the masterpiece in progress. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. This has been an amazing conversation. I you've shared some wonderful, wonderful words of wisdom today. There we go. <laughs> and I appreciate it. Um, if someone does want to book you for a virtual speaking tour or something, um, what is the best way for people to be able to get in contact with you? We have two websites uh, for churches and religious organizations. They can contact us through tinygiant.com, T-I-N-Y-G-I-A-N-T.com, which by the way, we're gonna merge eventually by the first of the year, I hope into one. Mm -hmm. The other one is jeffsteinberg.net, booking at jeffsteinberg.net, booking at tinygiant.com. Contact us there or have your audience get in touch with you you and I've been in touch with each other so many times. Absolutely. Now we're, I'll, I'll owe you a commission. <laughs> <laughs> I'll graciously accept. How about that? <laughs> there you go. Oh, well, thank you so much for being here. And uh, this was an absolute honor to hear from you. And I'm, I'm really glad that we've gotten to know you and for you to share your wonderful story with our listeners. I appreciate you so much. Gloria, it's been amazing. And thank you so much for putting up with our postponements and, and such like that. And more than that, you and I have talked uh, on the way to this and you've been very candid and very helpful. And I appreciate that a lot. And uh, um, it's my pleasure. And I'm always happy to come on and be with you. I appreciate that as well. And we may have you back again sometimes in the near future. So I appreciate that. So, and for all of you out there who are watching and listening, thank you as well for being supporters of Live, Love, Engage. I appreciate all of you. And in closing, as always, I always want you to be able to go out there and live fully, love deeply and engage authentically.